by the way, most people agree on, most people, including myself, even though um, I'm personally, I personally view abortion as like a, a sin and a stain on your conscience as a woman. But, you know, I'll be upfront, I've had an abortion. And I think that that is something that most women don't take lightly. But the fact is, in, in this country, um, you only hear the voices of the extreme fanatics. Kind of, but not really. I get where she's coming from in that as long as you keep it general and say the, the fanatics on either side, but also no. I feel like it's sort of a, well, I'm going to do it and ask forgiveness rather than not do it at all. I, I dislike the idea that, oh, well, I did this thing, I made this choice, but now it's a sin and I, I need forgiveness for it. I, I don't think so. I don't think she needs forgiveness at all. Yeah, no, the sin part really um, messed with my brain too. Where mm -hmm. It's like a sin, but sometimes you have to do it. I would love to ask her what a sin is. It's like, well, you know, abortion's murder, but sometimes you have to murder. Like, oh, okay, well, maybe we can reframe this. So we have 75% uh, of women who have abortions. One already has children, two are impoverished, meaning that they would make different decisions if they had more money, if they could afford to keep the baby. Saying that, my government has put me into a position where I would want to keep a child, but I can't, is right. a stain on on a woman's conscience. Mm. It's a stain on the woman's conscience that the government is legislating and throwing them into jail for. I, and I hate this idea that we should bear the women specifically. Men are never into this or also be in the decision to terminate the pregnancy. Men are having these conversations with women. Again, 75% of these women are impoverished. They're going to men asking for money because there are very few states that are paying for this procedure. You can't do it with federal funds. The state either has to provide for it or the woman has to come solely out of pocket for it. But it's a stain on her conscience. Yeah, she there's, made there's this decision. She should go to jail. This is bullshit. Yeah, there, there's a lot of internalized misogyny all around that th those debate tables but also I, I i appreciate the fact that you brought up that you can't use federal funds and often these do have to be paid out of pocket which just kind of nukes that conservative argument that people are using it as a convenient form of birth control right i do have to acknowledge that i like the way that she framed hey this is a, a big decision for a woman and she's not because we hear so much rhetoric about women are just going out and you know on the weekend and getting a boy you know it's just Pretty a much. fun Right, exactly. And and it is so, it's such a straw man of the incredibly difficult choice that a woman makes going through this. And I think at least she acknowledged that, you know, I've known quite a few women that have had abortions and requires a lot of thinking, a lot of, a lot of looking into things, a lot of consideration. It's never made lightly. For 99.9% yeah. .9 of women, it is a massive decision. They have no idea what is going on. And it, it's, insane to me. I, I hate this so much. I watched, it wasn't now this, it was another thing like that where they were actually talking to uh, people who were doing the March for Life. They were like, well, if a woman is having a pregnancy related issue, what does she do? Well, she needs to pray. Yeah, because that, she shouldn't help. abort the baby. Yeah, she just needs to pray. If God wants her to live, he will answer that prayer. And if not, well, you know, this is God calling you home. Oh, disgusted me. Oh, Absolutely that is, disgusted that is me. terrible. That's terrible. If there's a God that created an entire separate sex just to have babies, I want you to think about this. He also made their sole purpose, the most difficult life-threatening thing they will ever do. And, um, and the last thing you need is And to is tell a woman happening. that she should have to make one yeah, decision. Yeah. But like the, the idea that you need some fucking asshole screaming at you and saying that you're gonna burn in hell is the last thing that a woman needs. We, we need to have more compassion for people, I think, you know, to, to understand where they're coming from. Act like mom when she makes no sense. Gotcha. Okay. Because if he ain't give me no money, he ain't getting no honey. Girl, and I know that's right. Mom? Hold on. Um, yes. Can you give me a ride to my friend's house? Why? Why? No, why? Well, uh, well it's for water. And Jesus turned that into wine. And while you whining in my face about me and the rod, I suggest you to look up Ephesians chapter 7, verse 2. You know what that says? What do you think it says? I don't know. Take a little guess. Get out my face. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> I think the fundamental argument your side is advancing is basically saying expanding freedom is generally a good thing. But freedom for one group, as we have seen, I think, in the past few decades, often means less freedom for another group. Yes, she's not wrong. If you're taking away, if you're sort of saying, hey, these people have the freedom to, say, express themselves without freedom content, of other you know, people to belittle and, and denigrate them kind of thing, you know, to stifle their progress. I don't care about taking away that kind of freedom. If you're doing harm, then you don't have the freedom to do harm to people. So uh, uh, maybe it's just a United States thing, but basically every conservative group who's opposed to every other group having equal rights makes the default argument that giving those people rights diminishes their own rights. Gays shouldn't be allowed to get married because it makes my marriage not special. Trans people when... shouldn't be allowed to have medical care because it makes my medical care more expensive or take longer, whatever. To them, freedom is a finite quantity. And if you give some to somebody else, you have less. And I think that's what she's trying to say here. Because it is I'm a- I'm not sure every because we're not, topic. we're not talking about rights, we're talking about freedom. So mm -hmm. um, maybe that's what she's talking, I, I don't know. I may maybe we should play a bit more. And I agree with you totally on that, Ember, don't get me wrong, but rights are one thing and freedoms are another. You're making this distinction between freedom and right. And there's yes. a section of Americans who don't. Yeah, it, oh. here it's a distinction without a difference. If you don't have mm -hmm. the right for something, you, that isn't a freedom you have. And we agree with you, Mark. I, I, I don't understand that. Yeah, no, like, you shouldn't. Not all that, that's the, are that's right, the reasonable response. I, I'll agree with Mark in so far as the moderator should have made that explicitly clear. And she's conflating, which if she's an American, she should know better than and should actually separate. Okay. Arguably because of the sexual revolution are growing up in a broken home or a home with just one parent, while their more wealthy counterparts either can afford nannies or grow up in a two parent homes and they have demonstrably better outcomes across the board. So how do you reckon with the fact that freedom to choose has really meant freedom to choose for the wealthy or the upper middle class and freedom to choose for everybody else has largely meant being relegated to whatever the man who got them pregnant decides to do. So, so that's, that, a that's almost her own rebuttal. That's like a whole freaking statement on her own. Without she's not she's playing it off like she's prompting Grimes, but she's doing her own soapboxing there. And there's so yes. much wrong with that. She basically just asserted that a woman's ability to choose her own sexual partners causes more broken homes, and that wealthy families who can afford nannies and whatnot because there's nannies they have a better outcome. Woman. The fact that they're fucking rich and can afford to take care of their child is why they have a better outcome. Yeah, so I was going to say, like, it's more a the state of capitalism than it is of, you know, the sexual revolution. Mm -hmm. Like, yes, you know, this is that. a problem with capitalism that, that outcomes and we've, are not. And we've seen this across the board with and without women's rights. Children who are born into more privileged families have better, quote unquote, better outcomes and better uh, is subjective, um, granted. But oh, oh yeah, I, definitely. Because when you have too much privilege, I, I don't, you end up like these four. <laughs> I hate this question, for sure. It, she's She's sort of. Um, like she was doing the same for the other side to be fair, just sort of attacking their points kind of thing as a, as a moderator, which is a weird style. Mm -hmm. I don't get it, but whatever. You know, can't they come up with their own questions for either side rebuttal, whatever. Even if you're going to make a question, that, does they have to be loaded? Well, the fact that women can be a single mother and can have a career and can raise their children by themselves, regardless of what the man does, is a product of the sexual revolution. They yeah. would not have that choice if we were back before the sexual revolution. It would be, well, you've got to stay with the man no matter what happens. And if he abandons yeah. you, you're just screwed. <laughs> it, it upsets me a lot because this isn't even a thing that actually changed with the sexual revolution. Like women having control of their own bodies doesn't do mm -hmm. anything to change the nature of long-term relationships. Mm -hmm. People are still going to have difficulties. People are still going to break up. And immediately before this was the Vietnam War, and before that was the Korean War, and before that was World War II, and before that was World War One. And there, through the entire damn century, there were women raising children on their own because their husbands were fucking killed in these endless wars. Sexual revolution had nothing to do with that. I mean, yep. it ensured a woman's ability to take care of herself regardless of what happened to her husband, mm. which we haven't al always had. Actually, yeah. they've only had very recently. Yeah, generally, women that had their husband sort of abandon them or leave them would end up destitute mm -hmm. in, a, in a pauper's home kind of thing, you know? Yeah, even in the Bible where it talks about, take, please take care of the widows. Like, 
their husband died. Yeah. They have no means of supporting themselves. It's totally different than the now. Or I watched Jennifer Bird on Myth Vision and um, she talks about um, biblical marriage. And I only bring this up because of um, how long and pervasive this is. And it predates the Bible for sure. You know, when we see these issues of should we divorce, we take it to mean something completely different today. You know, back in the day, it's like, okay, well, should you divorce? It was almost kind of a courtesy to a, a woman. I mean, insofar as we got any, because we weren't allowed to do anything. There were no inheritance rights to women per se. You married well, hopefully, or as, as well as you could. And there went your ability to be comfortable with uh, whatever was left with your life. It depends on what society and at what time, you know, any, anything under biblical or Abrahamic rule has been geared towards the men. And the women have just kind of been these like passive bystanders. I guess it's a feminist issue, but it, it's really, I don't know. It just seems religious to me. And I'm having a hard time with the question. It, it's, yeah, it's a, it's a complex issue with basically all of civilization tied up in it. There's capitalism, there's cultural beliefs that are tied to religion, there's social status, there's a, all kinds of things. And they're like, oh, but almost everything but the sexual revolution. <laughs> yeah, well, I... This is what's wrong with today. The young ladies today, they're not learning from mom. How come we're losing the recipe? Yeah, well, I, I take okay. issue a little bit with what, uh, the way that you phrase it in the end there, Barry, because yes. uh, it... I agree. Mm -hmm. Yeah, now now I feel rather awkward that I'm I'm agreeing with Sarah Hader on this. It's it's not actually the case. I think a lot of these like lower income women, like single mothers, are being very misunderstood. There's this idea that they're having a lot of casual sex and then they get pregnant because they're not uh, using you know. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Okay. Um, and that, or, or, that they don't want the children that they're having, that these uh, pregnancies are, you know, a disaster to them. But that's actually not true. When we listen to these women and we talk to them about their experiences, and there's been lots of studies done on this, you can, you can look at them up and you can talk to these mothers. Um, they will say that their pregnancies might be unplanned, but they are not unwanted. And they are a source of great meaning in a context where there's not, it's not, there's not a lot of easy ways to find meaning. And I think that's very important. Prior to the sexual revolution, between the post-war period and the sexual revolution, there were fewer single mothers than there are now, but there were far, far many more children who were being put up for adoption by mothers who wanted to keep them. This was called the baby scoop era. They should go home and look, them, look it up, maybe, because it was a horrifying time. The rates of American babies that were being put up for adoption were extremely high. There was a peak of it that was like, you know, 89,000 or something. So you can also look back in time and look at sort of the Oliver Twist era kind of thing and go, well, orphanages used to be everywhere, right? Orphanages mm -hmm. used to be a thing. It, it's not so much like that anymore. It's kind of our, our, our adoption system is kind of different. And that's not to say that problem's gone away, but it used to be a cultural thing that orphanages were just filled with orphans kind of stuff. So there is a cost to taking away women's choice. When you force women to have children, sometimes they just cannot take care of the children and you've got to plan for that. I, I do like what she's saying though. What would she call it? The, the baby scoop? Yeah. yeah. Like so it says um, from really 1945. ice cream. From 1945 to 1973, it's estimated that up to 4 million parents in the United States had children placed for adoption, with 2 million, dur 2 million during 1960s alone. Annual numbers for non-relative adoptions increased from an estimated 30, let's say 34,000 in 1951 to a peak of 89,000 in 1970, then quickly declined to an estimated 48,000 in 1975, which I guess was after Roe. This does not include the number of in infants adopted and raised by relatives. Um, in contrast, the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services estimates that only 14,000 infants were placed for adoption in 2003. Wow. A another really, really important aspect to consider about that period isn't just that it was unwed mothers and, and dumping babies in orphanages. These women specifically were compelled to surrender their babies. They wanted to keep them, but mm -hmm. they were told by government agencies and outreach agencies, specifically the Catholic Church, but not exclusively the Catholic Church, that they had to give them up for adoption. They had to entrust them into these orphanages. Yeah. So it's it's a bit more insidious than just there were too many babies and no way to deal with them. There was coercion. And, and I'll, yeah. I'll also bring up so the I, generations okay. of Australians um, who were the First Nations people who had their, their babies taken away from them. And um, that was horrific. And, and uh, the, the government said, sorry. Um, I, I think we should all be, be sorry about that. That is, that is horrific. All right, and so um, what I'm seeing again, is just a simple Google search. 9% of women um, who gave birth pre-Roe v. Wade gave their babies up for adoption. So it's only 9%. Wow. 
Wow. Um, but as of 2021, of the 50, let's say 54,000 children and youth who were adopted in 2001, 55% were adopted by foster parents, 34% were adopted by a relative. So we still have very, very low number of adoption, which is about 7%. I mean, since Roe was, we're still only down to 7% of people giving their babies up for adoption. Does the right in America ever address stuff like that? Do they ever say, no, okay, no. we're going to repeal this, but this is how Never. we're going to deal with the increased adoption rate that's that's obviously going to come, right? Nope. It, well, it, it's insane. Now, there's, there's another fact. Of the ways that they were coercing people is they were effectively denying assistance. They were denying what today we would call uh, food stamps or welfare or, or whatever. They were saying, no, you can't have that because you're an unwed mother. You don't qualify. Mm -hmm. Right. So your only option is to give the baby up for adoption. And we could easily fix this problem. The The reason the passage of Roe was so important was because of this compulsory adoption practice, because social welfare programs were anathema. We could have mm -hmm. just done better in the first place, but then Roe wouldn't have had yeah. quite so much force behind it. We could do better now. There are so many things, and I keep saying to well, I, I have an addiction to arguing about the abortion topic. I'm like, if you want women to keep their babies, like, we don't have to like take abortion off the table. We could give living wages. We can guarantee health care, free pre-K and daycare. There's a lot of things we can do to like with like nu nutrition programs, TANF, food stamps, free lunches at school. Sex education would do wonders yeah, <laughs> for bringing the abortion numbers down. Well, as soon as you start saying that, they jump in and say, oh, well, then people will just have babies in order to get these things. And it's like, well, do you want the baby or do that. you not? I, it's very strange. It is really strange. And again, it's indicative of people not understanding what's going on. Most pe women who have abortions are doing so to continue to take care of the family they already have. It's double yeah, standards all the way I, down. I'm so mad oh, at the yeah. country right now. I mean, uh, being mad's fine. Um, you don't have personal control over your country. You can vote. You can you fucking can vote. vote. Like that that would help. That would help, that would help. That would help us a lot. The very minimum you can do is figure out who's doing what and voting for that person. People think yeah. that they that their vote will not count, and I swear it will. Mm -hmm. You know what? We are where we are because people primaried Republicans from the right. We can be better positioned if you, in particular, would run for office. But if you can't, the very least you can do is vote for your primaries and primary somebody, anybody from the left. And here's a news flash. The president of the United States is not the only person on the ballot. We have Mike Johnson because nobody was focused on that position. I'm voting for you, Maya, on next election. I'm, I'm voting for you. you. You've sold me. Thanks, Mark. Well, oh. in, in sort of give a bit of context, they're also in, in sort of right areas. They're making it more and more difficult to vote. And I think that is on purpose. Like the lines are becoming right. longer. They're making it harder to register. They're just making it more difficult. And what I would say oh. to people is, there's no way you can change that if you don't go through that red tape and difficulty. I know it's rough. I, I know they're making it hard, but the only way we make it easier is by going through that, getting people in who will stop this sort of actions that they're taking to prevent people like you to vote. That's the only way to do it. So please just go through that. I know it's tiresome. I know they're being pricks. I know they're making it hard. Please just go through it and then vote for someone who can change the laws to allow greater access to voting. And then it'll become easier. That's the only way you can do it. And grab an absentee va ballot if you can, early vote if you can. Yeah. Many places still have plague era options that are still available. In fact, there was a, an election, oh, what was it, a couple of weeks ago? There, there happened to be a snowstorm. The Democrat candidate won because all the Democrats voted yes. early. And the Republicans all vote day yes. of, and there was a snowstorm, so they didn't show up. Mm -hmm. Yep, and actually that's how George Santos got replaced with the Democrat. Voting matters. And also, if you want to get your feet wet in voting, you can press that like button right now. Yeah. Easy, it's just right there. Just pr press it, press it right now. It's like voting, it's great. No and then it great. And then it declined. It declined fast the second women were able to get an ounce of freedom, an ounce of understanding and acceptance, there were literally tens of thousands or more babies in the arms of their biological mothers who wanted them because the stigma got better. While we're considering trade-offs, I think we should think about this one. Okay, too. well, let's talk a little bit. Grimes, do you want to jump in or can I? Well, I, I don't, either way, up to you guys. Go. Oh, um, I guess what I would say is like, Again, like we keep talking about symptoms and like if, like if you want to get back to the root cause, it's like the schools are fucked. People are not educated. People don't even understand their own fertility. They don't, like they don't understand how to not get pregnant. She, she's not wrong. I mean, the way that she's expressed it probably isn't the best, 
but she's not right like just saying the schools are fucked okay there, there's a systemic problem with the education system in most states and it, like it's a really weird way to say it i, I don't know Maybe it's just me. They don't understand what to do with. They do get pregnant. Kids have bad outcomes because kids are like not literate. Like kids are graduating from grade nine. Like, like we are in a massive literacy crisis. It's like, that's not the parents' fault. That's like our system is fundamentally failing and it's fundamentally failing. To is that true? Is there a lit literacy crisis in the US? Like people can't read? Uh, well, the, it's a problem, but to call it a crisis. Might not be accurate. Let's see, what's the current literacy rate? Uh, literacy in the United States. I will look up Australia as well to, you know, wow. just not pick on the United States. Uh, the U.S. national average literacy rate is only 79%. 21% of adults are illiterate, and 54% are below 6th grade reading level. Holy crap. Okay, yeah, I'll call that a crisis. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not um, surprised. I think the um, U.S. rate, the average, has always been fifth or sixth grade. So, I mean, and whether or not that's an indictment of the school system or just people not liking to read. Oh, no, I'm sure it's intentional. Um, where's Australia? Literacy levels in Australia. Someone help me. Uh, about 44% of adults read at a literacy level of 1 to 2. I don't know what that means. 38% read at a level of 3 and 15% read at the highest level 4 to 5 in Australia. I I'm sure that means something to you. I don't know what the levels are. I mean, I've never encountered that before. Dowelmanual.gov, Australia, dot AU, Australia. So I don't know, your government, it means something to your government. So pre-primary mm -hmm. level is below level one. One to six is level one. So that's that's pre-primary to level year six, year seven to 10 is level two, uh, okay. 11, 12. So, so basically oh, level three, Okay. So, so thirty eight percent. Yeah. So so forty four percent of adults read at a at a sort of year ten or or that's um, or higher. I'm not sure what. It's way better yeah, than or us. Higher. Well, no, that that's more than that. It's like because it's forty four percent. Thirty eight percent of adults read at uh, level three, and fifteen percent read at four to five, which is uh, diploma. Right okay. So level. three point seven percent of adults are in the pre primary level, below level one. So for America, that would be twenty one percent. Yeah, we're stupid. That's that is a crisis. That that's definitely. Like, I, I will have to agree with uh, Grimes on this one. It's if America. Sure. If we're talking about education, it's a crisis. You, mm, Amber, yeah. you've been here your whole life. Uh, look, I blame everything on Chat. Quite frankly, I'm kind of it's convenient that they're here. I just blame them for everything. I blame Tapioca like, tap well, why... Weasel. Oh yeah, well I don't have a Tapioca Weasel here a lot of the time, so I have to blame somebody. Oh, it doesn't. And Chat's always around. Not, so. I blame him anyway. Our culture doesn't make it easy to have kids and and so it's like we were like oh single mothers it's like it's it's not doing well it's like no the whole culture should fucking move children are sacred we won't live as a species if we don't have more kids and we're like personally not a replacement right it's it's a bit of an issue we hear it a lot mm. from conservatives like <laughs> the brown people are out reproducing the white people we're not keeping up with replacement rate and all this mm -hmm, crap mm -hmm. it, it's got got low-key racist overtones in there yeah low-key low-key yeah <laughs> but also, we have a population crisis. We don't need replacement rate. Population is not capitalism. It doesn't need to constantly grow. That's actually not sustainable. We probably mm -hmm. should reduce our population a little. Well, Bill Gates talked about reducing population. Everyone jumped on it saying he wants to kill people. And it's like, no, all he's saying is no. slow down on the earth. So we have the resources to cover the population. That's it. So some resources are perfectly fine. Some resources mm -hmm. we have in abundance, sure. like carbons and things like that. It's not a problem. Iron, there's tons of it. Like there's not a problem with iron. Um, other resources are going to be a problem if the population rate keeps up. One of them just being fresh water. Yeah, another one being um, helium of all things. Like helium's really useful in super cool applications. It's really useful in um, medical imaging. I believe MRI scanners use helium as a cooling solution. Like it's actually incredibly useful because it's an inert gas. Uh, the problem is that people are putting it in fucking balloons and, and letting them go into the sky where it actually escapes into space and we lose it and we're short. We're going to be short. It's stuff like this that people don't think about. Not all resources will replenish themselves at the rate that which we're using it. Oil, for instance, we've burnt through half of the world's oil supply in roughly 300 years. Mm -hmm. um, that is completely and utterly unsustainable with, with the population growing and us using more and more oil. We have to start thinking about what we're gonna do a thousand years into the future, 2,000 years into, 3,000 years into the future. 10 years in the future even i mean that would be nice. outside of our this is an outside of our lifetimes yeah if you could just think about five years from now that would be great well this is sort of what i want to get across and this is what my channel is about i want people or i would like people i, I suppose i can't demand that they do so but i would like people to start thinking beyond their lifetimes to start going hey i'm part of this chain of the human species and we've got to start thinking about 
what the world is going to be like down the track instead of what am I doing 10 years into the future? It's like, mm -hmm. what will humans do 2000 years from now? I would um, love that. But remember earlier when we were talking yeah. about, I would love it if we could talk about the well-being of people, but I'll settle for people just not trying to kill me. Right. No, it you is know, can completely Can I, can I just get to the point where me and, me and Ember aren't, where they're not actively trying to ship me and Ember off to concentration camps. And what we once we get comfortably there, then we can think about like other shit. And it, it, it kind of feels like that for me and like people a thousand years from now. Now again, you know, I, I finished my last stream talking about my legacy. I would love it to be of love and people thinking long-term. And I am so with you. I think we should think sustainably. We should never ever dig up oil if it means that at any point in the future, carbon emissions are going to be out of control. We need to think about other things. Totally all for that. However, I can, I, I would like to just be able to breathe the air in 20 years because I expect that I'll still be here. No, and I, I just I, think about I, that first. And then, no, no, you know, no, I, I acknowledge that. that. Then I acknowledge that. And, and I acknowledge that's a way more important issue. And that's the thing we should focus on. Don't get me wrong. I think 100% mm -hmm. um, we should focus on, you know, like well, sustainability sure. in the next 20 years, right? That's absolutely it. But I, I see um, sort of from my point of view, I see there's no reason why as an ideology, as an ideal, I can't mm -hmm. say, hey, I can think beyond my lifetime and mm -hmm. consider that, even mm -hmm. though these these imminent problems are way more important. You know, let's put our direction. But yeah. we can think that way. We can think, yeah. hey, we're part of a long chain that's going to go on way after I'm dead. And hopefully my body will help boost a tree that helps the next generation. And hopefully we can start our thinking as let's prime ourselves for helping the next generations and helping the next to come and, and even further on down the track. I think that mm -hmm. mindset itself is helpful. Yes. Um, even if we, you know, and I'm not saying, you know, dwell on it or get mm -hmm. upset about it or, you know, no, no. You, know you, you can only do what you can do. I, I completely agree. There's massive more problems than what are we going to do about helium a hundred years from now? Like I get you, but we can still go, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to have this mindset of it is not just about the things in front of me, but rather I can lift my eyes and see what's way down the road. Even if I can't do anything about where we're going right now. I, I want to do that. I, I do want to, but I kind of feel, again, like it's it's almost futile when we have a bunch of people thinking that it's ridiculous to think about carbon emissions today because only God can make the, the earth better. Like humans can't do anything about climate change. Only oh, God totally. can do yeah. that. Footprints in the sand, but then you turn around and see another set because Jesus was with you all along. My name is Amy. It's nice to say, don't think about what you're saying. We absolutely have to. There has to be a long game, but holy crap, we are we are so far behind. That's okay. I don't worry about that at all. Um, the thing is that a lot of um, Christians have told me, and and you know, these are the people that say, hey, you know, the believe that God is going to come, and you know, their imaginary friend is going to save us from all of the problems that we've got, you know, in the future kind of thing. And they've told me that, hey. Um, they've said you're different you actually have a story to tell like this this being part of this species that is growing and evolving and there's light at the end of the tunnel that we can work towards together they like that i have a story and and you know mm -hmm. I, I can i can say that story at the end of the day with what i believe if we don't make it if humans mm -hmm. don't make it if we go extinct that's just part of evolution that's just part of the the story you know like it's up to us to do mm -hmm. what we can and there's, you know, if, if humans go extinct, there's going to be no one to mourn us because animals don't care. Yeah. And evolution will just throw up, I don't know, my bets on octopi, quite frankly. They're incredibly intelligent. Maybe, maybe uh, birds. Really? I'm, I'm, going sure. dolphin, I'm going with yeah, dolphins, but I'm going with dolphins, but you know what? Bet. Octopi could, could be, could be. Could be. So I, I'm I, pretty sure that we're hell bent on killing ourselves. So we'll right. see what we're If we next. don't survive, we don't mm -hmm. deserve to. That's Fair. it. We're like in the great scheme of things kind of we thing, killed ourselves off there is no asteroid that hit the earth yes so in that case give us a darwin award and let's yeah. move on to the dolphins yeah